Welcome to Friday. Now we're doing something different from our Wednesday poetry. We're doing short stories. And at the recommendation of a very dear friend of mine, um, she reminded me of some joy I had many years ago reading James Thurber. What a magnificent comedic artist he was, both in terms of drawing and in terms of his words. You may actually be aware that he was part of the Algonquin Round Table. Now we've got to remember that included Dorothy Parker. Remember, men seldom make passes at girls who wear glasses, words to that effect. Well, here is a short story he wrote, which is autobiographical and about his childhood. The night, the bed fell. I suppose that the high watermark of my youth in Columbus, Ohio, was the night the bed fell on my father. Now, it makes a better recitation, unless, as some friends of mine have said, one has heard it uh, five or six times, then it does as a piece of writing, for it is almost necessary to throw furniture around, shake doors, bark like a dog to lend the proper atmosphere and verisimilitude to what is admittedly a somewhat incredible tale. Still, it did take place. It happened then that uh, my father had decided to sleep in the attic one night to be away where he could think. And my mother opposed the notion strongly because she said uh, the old wooden bed up there was uh, unsafe. It was wobbly and the heavy headboard would crash down on father's head in case the bed fell and kill him. There was no dissuading him. However, and at uh, a quarter past ten, he closed the attic door behind him, went up the narrow, twisting stairs. We later heard ominous creakings as he crawled into bed. And grandfather, who usually slept in the attic bed when he was with us, had disappeared some days before. On these occasions, he was usually gone six or eight days and uh, returned growling and out of temper with the news that the Federal Union was run by a passel of blockheads and that the Army of the Potomac didn't have any more chance than a fiddler's bitch. We had visiting us at this time a nervous first cousin of mine named Briggs Beal, who believed that he was likely to cease breathing when he was asleep. It was his feeling that if he were not awakened every hour during the night, he might die of, of suffocation. He had been accustomed to setting an alarm clock to ring at intervals until morning, but I persuaded him to abandon this. He slept in my room, and I, I told him that I was such a light sleeper that if anybody quit breathing in the same room with me, I would awake instantly. He tested me the first night, which, you know, I had suspected he would, by holding his breath after my regular breathing had convinced him that I was asleep. I was not asleep, however, and called to him. This seemed to allay his fears a little, but he took the precaution of putting a uh, glass of spirits of camphor on the little table at the head of his bed. That was in case I didn't arouse him until he was almost gone, he said. He would sniff the camphor, a powerful reviver. Briggs was not the only member of his family who had his uh, crotchets. Old Aunt Melissa Beale 
who could whistle like a man with two fingers in her mouth, suffered under the premonition that she was destined to die on South High Street. Because she had been born on South High Street and married on South High Street. Oh, then there was Aunt Sarah Shope, who never went to bed at night without the fear that a burglar was going to get in and, and blow chloroform under her door through a tube. To avert this calamity, for she was in greater dread of anesthetics than of losing her household goods, she always piled her money, silverware, and other valuables in a, a, a neat stack just outside her bedroom with a note reading, this is all I have. Please take it and, and do not use your chloroform as, as this is all, all I have. Aunt Gracie Schoff also had a burglar phobia. Oh, but she met with it with much more fortitude. She was very confident that burglars had been getting into her house every night for 40 years. The fact that she never missed anything was to her no proof to the contrary. She always claimed that she scared them off before they could take anything by throwing shoes down the hallway. When she went to bed, she piled where she could get at them handily all the shoes that were about her house. Five minutes after she had turned out the light, she would sit up in bed and say, hark, to her husband, who had learned to ignore the whole situation as long ago as 1903, would uh, either be sound asleep or pretend to be sound asleep. In either case, he would not respond to her tugging and pulling so that presently she would arise, tiptoe to the door, open it slightly, and heave a shoe down the hall in one direction, and its mate down the hall in the other direction. Some nights she threw them all, some nights only a couple of pairs. But I am straying from the remarkable incidents that took place during the night that the bed fell on father. By midnight, we were all in bed. The layout of the rooms and the disposition of their occupants is important to an understanding of what later occurred. In the front room upstairs, just under father's attic bedroom, were my mother and my brother, Herman, who sometimes sang in his sleep, usually marching through Georgia or onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. Well, Briggs Beale and myself were in a room adjoining this one, and my brother Roy was in a room across the hall from ours. Our bull terrier, Rex, slept in the hall. Now my bed was an army cot. You know one of those affairs which made, was wide enough to sleep on comfortably only by putting up, flap with the middle section, the two sides which ordinarily hung down like the side uh, boards of a drop leaf table. When these sides are up, it is perilous to roll too far toward the edge, for then the cot is likely to tip completely over, bringing the whole bed down on top of one with a tremendous bang, crash. This, in fact, is precisely what happened about uh, two o'clock in the morning. It was my mother who, in recalling the scene later, first referred to it as the night the bed fell on your father. Always 
a deep sleeper, slow to arouse. Well, I then lied to, uh, uh, to Briggs. Uh, I was at first unconscious of what had happened when the iron cot rolled me onto the floor and toppled over on me. It left me still warmly bundled up and unhurt, uh, for the bed rested above me like a canopy. Hence, I did not wake up, only reached the edge of consciousness and uh, went back. Oh, the racket, however, instantly awakened my mother in the next room, who came to the immediate conclusion that her worst dread was realized. The big wooden bed upstairs had fallen on father. She uh, therefore screamed, Oh, let's, let's go, help, help your father. It was this shout, rather than the noise of my cot fallen, fall, falling, that wakened Herman in the same room with her. He thought that mother had become, for no apparent reason, hysterical. Oh, you, you're all right, Mama, he shouted, trying to calm her. They exchanged shout for shout for perhaps 10 seconds. Let's, let's go to your father, and, and you're right. Uh, that, uh, that woke up Briggs. By the time I was conscious of what was going on in a vague way, but did not yet realize that I was under my bed instead of on it, Briggs, Awakening in the midst of loud shouts of fear and apprehension, came to the quick conclusion that he was suffocating and that we were all trying to, uh, to bring him out. With a low moan, he, he grasped the glass of camphor at the head of his bed and instead of sniffing it, poured it all over himself. The room reeked of camphor. <laughs> Choked Briggs like a drowning man, for he had almost succeeded in stopping his, his breath under the deluge of pungent spirits. He leaped out of bed, groped toward the open window, but it came up against one that was closed with his hand. He beat out the glass. Oh, and I could hear it crash and tinkle on the alleyway below. It was at this juncture that I, in trying to get up, had the uncanny sensation of feeling my bed above me. Foggy with sleep, I now suspected in my turn that the uh, whole uproar was being made in a, a frantic endeavor to extricate me from what must have been an unheard of and perilous situation. Get me out of this, I bawled. Get me out. I, I think I had the nightmarish belief that I was entombed in a mine. Oh, <laughs> grass. Briggs, uh, floundering in his camphor. By this time, my mother, still shouting, pursued by Herman, still shouting, was trying to open the door to the attic in order to go up and get my father's body out of the wreckage. The door was stuck, however, and wouldn't yield. Her frantic pulls on it only added to the general banging and confusion. Roy and the dog were up now, uh, the one shouting questions and the other barking. Father, furthest away and soundest sleeper of all, had by this time been awakened by the battering on the attic door. He decided that the house was on fire. <gasps> I'm coming, I'm coming, he wailed in a slow, sleepy voice. It took him many minutes to regain full consciousness. Now my mother, still believing he was caught under the bed, de detected in his I'm coming, the mournful, resigned note of one who was preparing Oh, he's dying, 
She shouted. I'm all right, Briggs yelled to reassure her. I'm all right. He still believed that it was his own closeness to death that was worrying Mother. I found at last the light switch in my room, unlocked the door, and Briggs and I joined the others at the attic door. The dog, who never did like Briggs, jumped for him, assuming that he was the culprit in whatever was going on, and Roy had to throw Rex and hold him. We could hear Father crawling out of the bed upstairs. Roy pulled the attic door open with a mighty jerk, and Father came down the stairs, sleepy and uh, irritable, but safe and sound. My mother began to weep when she saw him. Rex began to howl. What in the name of God is going on here? asked Father. The situation was finally put together like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. Father had caught a cold from prowling around in his bare feet, but there were no other bad results. I'm glad, said Mother, who always looked on the bright side of things, that your grandfather wasn't here. And now, a glimpse into, I mentioned that Thurber was an artist. There were three illustrations that he made to accompany the story. You'll recognize this one, the shoe throwing ant. And two others, one, Briggs Beale, who came to the conclusion that he was suffocating and probably my favorite and one of the most rec recognizable Thurber pieces, the dog attacking in the hall. And thus endeth the reading of James Thurber and the night the bed fell.